It's easy to think of Temp and Tint as the go-to tool for adjusting white balance in Resolve. After all, our cameras have the exact same controls, right? But Resolve actually gives us three pairs of Temp and Tint controls. One in the Camera Raw tab, one in our Primaries tab, and one in the HDR tab. So which one is going to be the best for us to use when we're balancing? Turns out, none of them. In this video, I want to show you why that is and what you can use instead if you want more speed, more control, and more consistency when you're balancing your shots. Okay, let's dive in, and we're going to talk about each of these different sets of temperature and tint adjustments that are available to us here in the color page. Let's start with the raw tab here. The idea with the raw tab, this is an R3D shot that I've got pulled up here, and the idea is that these color temp and tint sliders that I have available to me here are going to one-to-one -one mirror what the camera operator, what the cinematographer would have seen if they had adjusted these same parameters in camera when they were gathering the image. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? What could the beef be with that? That sounds very simple and very one-to-one -one with adjusting temp and tint in camera. What's the problem? Here's the issue. My fundamental issue with making temp and tint adjustments in the camera raw tab is these are not color grading tools. Do you know how I know they're not color grading tools? Because I can't use them on all of my shots. And a consequence of not being able to use these on all of my shots is that I'm forced to maintain what I call a camera-centric frame of mind throughout my color grading process, where what I want to do is inhabit an image-centric frame of mind. By the time my color management is set up, I want to be using the same tools, the same techniques, and using my eye to look at the image and figure out where I want to see it go and be relating to the image on the basis of the image, as opposed to on the basis of the camera that it was captured on. If I'm having to be mindful of whether an image was shot on RAW and whether I can use these color temp and tint sliders or whether I need to use different color and te temp and tint sliders or different balancing techniques altogether, I'm forced to maintain a camera-centric frame of mind and I'm also not allowed to develop and refine and optimize a consistent color grading toolkit that does not need to change on the basis of camera. So that alone is my beef with adjusting temp and tint in the camera raw tab. The beef is really not as much with the results that we're going to get. You can get really good results here because it is making the same type of photometric camera type of adjustment that you would have gotten if the uh, same things had been moved around when the image was being gathered. So the results are going to be good, but it's the position of the tool and the relationship of the tool to the overall color grading process that makes it a deal breaker for me. And furthermore, these adjustments that we're going to get, the results that we're going to get that are going to feel nice and clean, like they're doing what we want, this is not the only way to get them. There's actually a way to get just as accurate and just as uh, thorough of a result with a color grading tool that is available right within Resolve. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. But for now, we're going to say Camera Raw for color temp and tint and for any other color grading adjustment for that matter, this is not where we want to be doing our color grading because it's not even a color grading tool. We want to be doing our color grading within our actual tool set, which doesn't have to change depending on the camera that we are grading with. Okay, let's now talk about temp and tint in our primaries tab here. These are the temp and tint controls that I first started using when I went on my multi-year detour of balancing exclusively with temp and tint. I really got almost kind of like addicted to it. And I was doing it exclusively for a couple of years there. And I think my reasons were similar to the reasons that most of us have, which is that it felt more accurate. And it also felt like a sort of simplified way of thinking about the image where I could just think about how cool or warm and then how green or magenta do you want it to be. And I was really, really uh, sort of drawn to both of those aspects of operating in this way. So I started by making adjustments using temp and tint here. Here's the problem. These temp and tint adjustments, even though if I turn this to the right, I'm getting in loosest terms a warmer image, or if I go to the left, I'm getting a cooler image, there is no firm, accurate color science backing the behavior of these knobs. This is literally an arbitrary mixture of red and green being introduced when I go uh, to the right, or an arbitrary mixture of green and blue being introduced when I go to the left. That's it. There's nothing color science backed by what's happening here. It's just an approximation based on what the engineers felt like was reasonable for the needs of most colorists. And that calibration that they did of like, well, how much red and green and what ratio of red and green should turning to the right produce in the image, 
that was based on the assumption of color grading on a display state image. What do I mean when I say that? This is not a display state image. This is a log state image because I have my color management set up like I always do when I'm color grading in my professional practice or here on the channel. The way that temp and tint were set up to work, the way that they were arbitrarily calibrated was to operate here after we have output into our display color space. So even the approximation, even the arbitrary behavior of the color temp and tint is not aligned with what the, the uh, Resolve engineers intended if I am grading using temp and tint while my image is still in a log state, which is always going to be how I'm grading. So it's kind of a double whammy uh, problem that we have there of it's arbitrary to begin with, and it's even further off the mark because I'm not using it in the way the tool was designed to be used. So this is not the way to adjust temp and tint. This, these temp and tint sliders are not the winner for making balancing adjustments in Resolve, even though they really can feel that way, right? Hey, it's our primaries. It's the first tab that we get introduced to when we're color grading, and they're right here, and they feel highly related to concepts that we're familiar with coming from the camera side of things but it's kind of a blind alley. It's kind of a detour. This is not the way that you want to be balancing your image. But this is not the only or the last set of temp and tint controls available to us in Resolve. Let's go over here to shot number three, and we're going to talk about the HDR tab for a second. The HDR tab is newer than the primaries tab, and it also has temp and tint controls. And again, if you look at the documentation for Resolve, you can get really good insight into what actually went into this? What's the intent of it? What's the backbone that's underlying the behavior of this set of controls? And in the case of temp and tint in the HDR palette, the backbone is better. The concept is better. They were trying to give us something more along the lines of a photometric color temperature adjustment, something closer to what we might get, for example, out of our camera raw tab over here. So the intent is good. The ideas are good, but there's still some problems here. The number one problem that I see is when I start to turn this range, the full bottom floor or top floor here are often not enough for me in my image. So as I go from unit uh, or to, from no adjustment to like full strength cooling of this image, that's nowhere near enough for what I would want to do with this image, right? And I would say just responding intuitively, something that I started to notice when I began doing my temp and tint adjustments here in the HDR palette, is even though I am nominally moving in units of degrees of Kelvin, like theoretically, the idea here is that I have cooled this image off by 4,000 degrees, doesn't feel that way to me. It feels like I've got a lot less than a 4,000 degree change in color temperature when I make this adjustment. And it started to make me question how accurate the actual behavior of the tool really is. Regardless of the intent of the tool, how accurate is it in application? And it turns out it's not very accurate. And there's a couple of reasons for that, but I want to show you one of the biggest ones right now. So let's go ahead and reset this. And let's go over here to shot number four. Now, before we dive into shot number four, I want to give you a sort of model for thinking about your balancing adjustments, okay? One or two things is always going to be true when you're going to make any balance adjustment on any shot. You are going to be in a situation in the minority of cases where you might get a shot like shot number four here, and you know this shot was gathered under a daylight uh, color temperature, but the camera was rated for tungsten, for example. You know that it was a 5,600 degree source, and you know that the camera was rated for 3,200. And in that case, there's a really cool tool that we can use to get a very accurate result, a very accurate adjustment of our image to align or account for that difference. Let's, uh, we're going to pull up our chromatic adaptation here from our effects, and I'm going to drop it onto an empty node. So check this out. Let's kind of make an example of this, and let's say that we know, I'm going to make up some numbers. We're going to say we know this image was gathered at 5,500 uh, in terms of the light source, but the camera was rated for 3,500. So here's how we would handle that. I'm going to set my aluminum type to color temperature, and I'm going to set my aluminum type for my target to color temperature. Kelvin is going to be 5,500, and Kelvin down here, 3,500. Okay? So, off and then on, even though I'm making those numbers up and I don't have the uh, actual firm uh, information that I'm uh, pretending that I do, I'm getting a decent result. And if I did, then I would be getting a really good result because I am using the best methods available to us in color science 
to align for a difference or a delta between the lighting source and the sensitivity of the camera, okay? So in this minority of cases where you know, hey, the light was this and the camera was rated for that and I want to close that gap using the best, most accurate color science available, chromatic adaptation is your friend. It's a great thing to have in your back pocket. But that's one of the two situations that is going to be true anytime you go to color balance an image and it's a minority, right? That's going to happen a minority of the time. Much more often you won't know that and you simply know that you want to warm the image off or warm the image up or cool the image off, right? In those situations, chromatic adaptation is not going to do a great job for you. And chromatic adaptation is never going to be a great go-to because you can see here, that's two adjustments that I have to make that is going to be a lot more cumbersome than a temperature knob. That's why temperature knobs started to be introduced. But here's the problem. Here's the other thing I wanted to show you. 5,500 to 3,500, right? We have just effectively warmed up the image by 2,000 degrees. But let's just try something here. Instead of 5,500 to 3,500, let's say I know the image was shot with a 6,500 degree source and the camera was rated for 4,500. Before I do that, let's just grab a still here. And now we're going to go 6,500, 4,500. In both cases, I'm warming the image by 2,000 degrees, right? So a knob wouldn't know the difference between these two adjustments. But look at the two different versions that I have here. Here is 5,500 to 3,500. Here is 6,500 to 4,500. Both 2,000 degrees of difference, but very different results on the image here. Well, what gives? What's the deal with that? Well, the problem is that the spectral locus, meaning that the axis of color temperature, going from low color temperature to high temperature, it is not uniform. It moves in different ways depending on what your starting point and what your end point is. So if your goal is accuracy, you actually need to know where you're starting in order to plot the correct journey. That's something that a single knob can't provide for us. So in lieu of knowing our starting point and of uh, being able to account for it, the temp knob here in the HDR palette, it's just assuming an arbitrary starting point and then adding or subtracting uh, degrees of Kelvin from that point. So just by that lens alone, it's not particularly accurate because it doesn't have the information that it needs and it doesn't want to slow us down to ask for it because we're often not going to have that information. Even if we did, a color balancing technique that involves needing to punch in explicit degrees of Kelvin twice for every single adjustment is a really, really slow, laborious process that simply wouldn't be practical, right? So where am I going with all this? What is our sort of like new script for getting consistent best balance adjustments that we can and being as accurate as we can when that's what's called for? Well, as I said, we've just looked at that first fork in the road. Do you happen to know the image was shot under these lighting conditions, but the camera was rated for, for X in that minority of cases? Definitely encourage using chromatic adaptation, at least trying it out before you start freehanding things. But the much larger percentage of cases are going to be where you simply need to make the image look more like you want it to look, right? That's the end of it. That's the only thing you can really say. And in that situation, you are better off being able to freely move wherever you want to go without the constraints that we see here in the temp and tint of the HDR palette without the inaccuracy that we have here and without being confused by, oh, I'm, I'm getting some kind of different or better or superior or more accurate result than I would be simply by free hitting my adjustments. So what do I like to do instead? Let's go back over to here, shot number one, and I'm going to show you. So here in shot number one, I'm going to right click on my tab or on my node rather. And I'm going to set my gamma to linear. And what I like to do to balance my images is here in the primary tab with my gamma set to linear, I'm going to take my gain and just move things around until I like what I'm looking at. Like so. How do I know where to go? How do I know what looks good? Practice and looking at the image. That's really all there is to it. Which, by the way, this is the point I really want to drive home. That's what you're doing anyway. With your temp and tint in your primaries, with your temp and tint in your HDR, with your temp and tint even in your camera raw controls. What are you using as the basis for how far should I move both or one of these sliders? your eyes, right? There's very, very few cases where you're like, oh, I need to solve for an accidental misalignment between camera and lighting source. If that comes about, chromatic adaptation is a great go-to. But the rest of the time, we are simply adjusting relative amounts of red, green, and blue 
to get to the outcome that we want. And if we do that in the right domain, which is linear, meaning the domain of physical light in the real world, and we use this one trackball, we can do it quickly, we can do it consistently, we can do it effectively, and all you have to do is get a little bit of practice logged so that you feel like you know how to navigate and position this signal blob within the larger circle. But there's something else that we can take away from thinking about temp and tint. And this is something that I took away from my couple of years of uh, working almost exclusively with temp and tint, which I uh, referenced earlier in this video, where it started to force me to think about the image or it allowed me to think about the image in a simpler way. What I mean when I say that is that I really, when I was using temp and tint all day, every day, I was simply thinking about two axes. I was thinking about one axis formed by my skin tone line, where I would just imagine continuing down through the bottom right of the vector scope, and another axis 90 degrees from that running through my green and magenta. And my mental concept of what I was doing started to shift from, oh my gosh, I have to find the perfect position for this somewhere within my vector scope. And instead I was just thinking about where along this axis of the skin tone line do I want to park and where along this axis of green and magenta do I want to park. So I found it to be a very simplifying sort of uh, like grounding concept to bring to my balancing work. But here's the good news. If you find that similarly helpful and grounding and sort of orienting when you're making your balancing adjustments, you can do it whether or not you're using temp and tent. That's still a concept that I use when I'm balancing today. I'm thinking about where on the skin tone line, roughly the temperature axis and where on the green magenta line, do I want this image to plot? And the only difference between doing that with temp and tint is I'm free to move wherever I want. I only have to move one control and I'm not tied up or constrained by notions of supposed accuracy of my temp and tint knobs, which simply aren't true. So I hope that's a helpful breakdown for you of what these different temp and tint controls do and how they differ from one another and why I truly believe that none of them are ideal for balancing our image. And in fact, no set of temp and tent controls ever really could be because as we saw with our chromatic adaptation example a moment ago, 2000 degrees of warmth is not enough information to make a robust color science accurate manipulation of the image. And if we're not making a thorough and accurate adjustment of the image, then we should feel free to freehand things and to get the ideal result without being bound by upper and lower limits or ideas that we are using a somehow different or more superior or more accurate tool.